Short Fuse first aired on January 19, 1972, the first Columbo of the year. It was directed by Edward Abrams. This episode of Columbo was his first ever directing assignment. Abrams' main line of work was editing, but he wanted to try his hand at directing for a while. So how in the world did he suddenly get to direct a Columbo episode? Well, he was the editor for Ransom for a Dead Man, Death Lends a Hand, and Lady in Waiting, and Levinson and Link, the creators of Columbo, were the ones who gave Ed Abrams this episode as a thank you for his superb editing. He will go on to direct one more future episode of Columbo, as well as an episode of Night Gallery, Mrs. Columbo, which should never have existed, and an episode of Murder, She Wrote. He will also be the editor for a 90s Columbo episode. And, I must mention, he was the editor for Street Fighter the movie. Despite this being his first ever directing assignment, Abrams was one of the few Columbo directors to finish on schedule. He didn't figure multiple takes were necessary, filming only what he needed and moving on. I suppose what may have contributed to this one take filming technique was the fact that Abrams only had 10 days to shoot this episode. You see, Short Fuse was a rush job ordered by Universal, basically as a backup episode in case Peter Falk completely fails at directing Blueprint for Murder. Universal clearly had no faith in Falk's abilities. I'd like to really quick lay out the timeline so far because things are a little chronologically confused. So of course we have Prescription Murder, the standalone TV movie. Then we have Ransom for a Dead Man, the pilot episode. No discrepancies so far. As I mentioned in the reviews, the first filmed episode of Columbo was Deathlands a Hand, and second was Murder by the Book, but their air dates were swapped. Next we have Dead Weight, which is where Peter Falk goes on strike in order to get his directing assignment he wanted. The next filmed episode was actually Lady in Waiting, which makes sense because the same body double in Dead Weight appears in this episode as well since Peter Falk is still causing trouble by not showing up to work in an attempt to get his directing assignment that keeps getting swept under the rug by Universal and NBC. Then Suitable for Framing is filmed and Peter is happy because by this point he has been promised the final episode for season 1. Therefore, he performs his work in this episode to the fullest. The next episode filmed is actually Peter Falk's episode, Blueprint for Murder, which is the final episode aired for the season. And then finally, our last minute decision episode, Short Fuse, which was filmed immediately after Blueprint for Murder with no rest period. The reason for the 10 day time crunch was because Peter Falk had a flight to New York scheduled for the 15th of September because he was headed for Broadway to perform The Prisoner of 2nd Avenue with Lee Grant from Ransom for a Dead Man. So hopefully that cleared up any filming confusion you didn't know you had. Now back to Short Fuse. The story was written by Lester and Tina Pine, who were both writers for the Poppy TV series, as well as Jackson Gillis, writing the story and the teleplay, who we have already met as the writer for Suitable for Framing. Our episode suddenly begins without an opening credit sequence, which isn't uncommon. Ransom for a Dead Man, Murder by the Book, and Death on a Hand all did the same thing. We find a man carefully working with some chemicals and a box of individually cased cigars. After about one minute, what seems to be a test experiment ignites and pops like a firecracker. It startles the man and he smiles, so it must have been successful. He then removes the exploded single cigar case and very carefully places the one he filled to the top with chemicals a moment ago and delicately attaches a thin wire, which must be the trigger, to a tiny nail. He then fills the rest of the box with more single case cigars and shuts the box where he then says the first line of the episode. Better than the Borgia. Now you're probably asking, what is that supposed to mean, right? Well, from what I've gathered, the House of Borgia was an Italo-Spanish noble family who rose to power during the Italian Renaissance. They were suspected of several heavy crimes involving adultery, theft, bribery, and murder in order to obtain power. Maybe as our story progresses, we can make some connections between this fellow and the Borgias. Now the scene changes to a very industrial location, and we see the same man riding a Harley Davidson golf cart. Yes, I said Harley Davidson golf cart. And what great cinematography already with a smooth crane shot and no cuts as we follow him on his little cart labeled Stanford Chemicals. The music for this episode was composed by Gil Malay. So far he's been responsible for Death on the Hand and Dead Weight. I love that they caught on film the burst of black smoke from the background smokestack. The man arrives at his destination where there is also a sign for Stanford Chemicals. 
As he enters an office full of typewriting women and one man, he wanders around silently looking at all these women who do not acknowledge him in the slightest. Then he walks up behind a woman with an afro and suddenly begins spraying silly string all over her and then all over everyone else, causing a huge ruckus. He's shouting a bunch of words that I have never been able to understand, so I looked up the script for this episode. He is saying, Time for a little spontaneous merriment. Workers arise. Protest the sale of your company. Your jobs. Please! Hey, what is that, plastic? Yeah. <laughs> you invent it? Oh, no, I wish I had. What is so interesting about there being Silly String this episode is that Silly String wasn't patented until late 1972, and this episode was filmed in September of 1971. I wish I could find out how and why they got a hold of a can of this prototype Silly String. It must have been quite a novel thing for viewers when this episode first aired. Mr. Sanford! Stanford? This goofy guy is who Stanford Chemicals is named after? Roger, what is the matter with you? Roger Stanford is played by Roddy McDowell. He was a child actor in How Green Was My Valley, My Friend Flicka and Lassie Come Home. Later he'll be remembered for playing Cornelius and Caesar in the Planet of the Apes films, where he co-starred with Kim Hunter and William Wyndham as well as being in the Planet of the Apes TV series. He was also in every episode of Tales of the Gold Monkey. He co-starred with Eddie Albert in a McCloud episode. He was in Cleopatra and in Lord Love a Duck with a future Columbo villain, as well as Fright Night 1 and 2 and Overboard. Roger, what were you doing in your dark room? Now, don't you worry. You were underexposed. Y you, you didn't develop those pictures. <laughs> Well, considering the deep concern in her face, I think I have an idea of what kind of pictures we're talking about. The secretary's name is Valerie Bishop, and she is played by Anne Francis. She starred in Lydia Bailey, Bad Day at the Black Rock, and Forbidden Planet, co-starring with both Leslie Nielsen and Richard Anderson from Lady in Waiting. She was the star of the Honey West TV series, for which she won a Golden Globe. And we'll get to see her in one more future Columbo episode. Miss Bishop then tries to rush Roger into an office and says, Your uncle is very upset. What is that stuff doing here? B Benson dropped it off. But he isn't going to Pine Wild until tomorrow morning. Now at breakfast, he told Aunt Doris. So he changed his mind. I have no idea who or what they are talking about. Hopefully things will clear up soon. Have you checked to make sure that Benson packed everything he needed? That's... Uh, 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 uh. No cigars. Do you realize what will happen when the great D.L. wakes up to find no box of Fidel's finest? While Miss Bishop goes to the cupboard for cigars, Roger slyly removes a pocket case of cigars from the coat and stuffs them in the back of his pants. And then he starts taking pictures of the distraught secretary, which ends up with a nice little edit with the click of the camera and the click of the lighter being combined. Give me a smile. All right, then. I can't really tell what the lighter itself looks like, but it seems kind of fancy, I guess. Now Roger is in an office with a cigar-smoking man and taking his picture. Wonder where those cigars went that he stuffed down his pants. Roger, would you put that silly camera down and tell me? Now, what do you think? <laughs> We find during this little dialogue that the cigar man is Roger's Uncle David, also called D.L. because his middle name starts with an L, apparently, and he is married to Roger's Aunt Doris. We also find out that Roger is actually Roger II, and this is his father's plant, who is deceased. Uncle David is now the president of the company and wants Roger to approve the sale of this company to a big conglomerate. I've got to get rid of this rumor that the sale of the company is going to endanger their jobs. It's not. It's not going to change anything around here. Except at the top. Roger argues with him about selling and mentions the vice president, Logan, also opposes the sale. And his aunt, Dory, David's wife, is also not persuaded to sell the company. She'll go along just as soon as you do. If she hadn't bent over backwards to spoil you and pamper you when she took you in as a kid. What is this I'm seeing? David has a picture of himself facing towards him on his desk. A picture of him alone, not with he and his wife, but just him alone, posing, facing towards him. Not out in the hallway on the wall, but on his personal desk. I do not understand that. Then David has Quincy present an ultimatum, or maybe you could call it blackmail, to get Roger to approve the sale of his father's company. Quincy presents proof of Roger's gambling, forgery, drugs, and car theft. Quincy, I tell you, you are superb. You know, you, you are the best combination chauffeur and private detective in the business. I want you to go see your Aunt Dory. Tell her you don't care about working here anymore. You're quitting. 
Otherwise, I'm afraid I'll, I'll have to show her all this. You really would, wouldn't you? Roger informs David that he's been aware of what Quincy and he have been up to for the past few months. Uh, seeing you've got my back up against the wall, you win. Hmm? David can't believe he would give up this easily. I just know when uh, I'm outclassed. I'll sign it tonight. Who wants a chemical company? Then a couple men come in for a meeting, but before Roger leaves, he makes sure to say goodbye to his uncle. Good night, Uncle David. <sighs> David is played by James Gregory. He's actually another Planet of the Apes actor. He was also an Al Capone, the Manchurian Candidate, every episode of The Lawless Years, and regular appearances in the Barney Miller TV series as Inspector Frank Luger. I noticed he keeps his ultra-high-waisted pants up with a belt that he fastens to the side. I have never seen anyone do that before. Miss Bishop asks Roger what it was his uncle wanted, and he goes over to kiss her and tell her it was nothing. Then he slips out of the back of his pants those cigars that disappeared earlier and drops the case on the floor, nudging it under her desk. Roger heads outside to leave and sees a man polishing a 1969 Lincoln Continental executive limousine. Wasting your time, Fergie! It's gonna rain! Ferguson is played by Eddie Quillen. You'll find him in the films Big Money, Girl Crazy, Mutiny on the Bounty, Young Mr. Lincoln, and The Grapes of Wrath. Roger asks Ferguson to look under the hood of his car. I think I've got a loose plug wire or something. Huh? As Fergie goes to check Roger's car, Roger looks around suspiciously and opens the door to his Uncle David's limo. Could he possibly look more devious? So he switches the cigar box, making all sorts of faces and about to shut the door, when suddenly he remembers something, while displaying the most pathetic expression imaginable. Reaching into the glove box, he grabs two single cigars and makes another goofy face. Do any of you keep gloves in your glove compartment? Come to think of it, I never have. Hey, remember that scene from Police Squad? You still got that tape that Norberg gave you for Christmas? Yeah, it's in the glove compartment. As Roger shuts the door, he again looks super guilty and up to no good, and then he tries to act natural. Ferguson says there is nothing wrong with this car, and Roger closes the hood as David and Quincy head towards the limo. And now a song begins to play that was originally from Dead Weight's opening credits. David gives Ferguson a cigar as a tip and gets into the car. Quincy puts his hat on and looks over to Roger, who is innocently sitting and observing. Roger watches them drive off in his side mirror, which should be, you know, mirrored. But we are actually looking at it unreversed because it is, once again, our amazing superimposed image over top of another. Then Roger happily lights up one of those stolen cigars with his nice, normal lighter. And now, some wild lightning, thunder, and heavy rain in the night with some spiky headlights reminiscent of Ransom for a Dead Man. In the deep darkness, we barely see with the headlights a sign that says Sky Ridge 18 miles. And suddenly in the night, we are outside a club called Narciss, and some real funky music begins to play. Roger walks in to see Valerie the secretary. He gives her a kiss and she quickly melts. The scene continually switches between Roger and Valerie's date and David and Quincy's drive in the dark stormy night. Quincy is played by Lawrence Cook. He stars in um, The Spook Who Sat By The Door and he is also in over 60 episodes of Days of Our Lives and was in the film Posse. Quincy reaches into the glove box to find no gloves or cigars so he hands the rigged cigar box back to David. We watch him peel off the black tape and crack open the box. Flashback to the dark room timer and then a bolt of lightning. Now Roger and Valerie are all huggy-duggy at the club. As Roger glances over, we see a caged go-go dancer wiggling around. No clue who she is, but she made it into Colombo, whether or not she knows it. I'm almost suspicious that Abrams brought his camera along to an actual club one night to get some nightclub footage because it looks so different from the rest of the footage. And then, for whatever reason, Roger has a look at his watch as if he knows the bomb is waiting to blow. And it does. Big ol' explosion. I think this would be considered the first indirect murder, meaning it was not face-to-face, -face, and our second double homicide. Dale Kingston in Suitable for Framing was the first to kill more than once in an episode. It was about 45 seconds from the time he opened the box to the explosion. Now it looks like Roger is heading home, and as he passes by a house, he looks over and sees a particularly noticeable car. Columbo's dusty old Peugeot 403 convertible. 
Roger moves on to a different house and parks his 1971 Ferrari 365 GTV4 Daytona in the garage. He has the exact same car as Beth Chadwick from Lady in Waiting, just different paint jobs. Roger heads upstairs to an outdoor entrance and we soon begin hearing a typewriter. Then he rushes down the stairs with the typewriter in hand and puts it in the back seat of his car and closes the garage. He then runs back upstairs to turn off the light and... Oh, sir? Uh, who are you? Why, it's Columbo. About time, wouldn't you say? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Lieutenant Columbo. I'm from the police. The police? You mean that old heap out there is yours? Oh, yeah. Needs a coat of paint, doesn't it? I love it when Columbo talks about his car. Columbo says he was sent over here to get Roger by Mrs. Buckner, which would be Roger's aunt and David's wife. Why? What's wrong? Well, nothing that we know about so far, so I suggest that uh, you close your door. Roger says this is the chauffeur's house, and then Columbo gets all excited because that means this is Quincy's place, so he better take a look inside. Now, what has happened? Uh, Mr. Buckner, he sort of disappeared. He may have been attacked somewhere. Yes, your aunt says there's been some kind of trouble out there at Stanford Chemical. Well, looky here, a black and white version of David's desktop picture. Is he the only one that is worth a photo in the family? Well, he uh, has been threatened. But those are from hotheads. Hotheads? What are they hot about? He's been negotiating with a conglomerate, dickering to sell. Dickering. We should bring dickering back to our everyday English. And did you side with your husband on this? I was in the process of making up my mind. David is missing. That's the only issue. Mrs. Buckner mentions that David should have arrived at Pine Wild, where they have another home, hours ago, and nobody has heard from him. She wishes he had taken the aerial tram because it's so much safer. Maybe they got hungry. Maybe they stopped off somewhere for a drink. Raj, you know that isn't so. He told Benson he'd have supper up there. There's another mention of Benson. Who is this Benson person? Columbo mentions that Highway Patrol hasn't reported any accidents on the road. Roger says it's time for a drink. Uh, do you want a drink? I called the commissioner of police, and he said he'd send over his very best man. I like this little moment of silence while they both look at Columbo after that statement. Is that a fact? Well, my wife, she says I'm second best, but, uh... She claims there are 80 fellas tied for first. I'm not sure what that sentence means. Maybe it's like his wife is encouraging him to keep striving to be the best? And I have no doubts that Columbo is the very best of the LAPD, but he's also homicide, and there is no homicide. Looks like there's a family crest on the wall in the background there. Then Columbo mentions that Mr. Buckner left a phone message earlier. You can tell that he's calling from a car. You can, you can hear it on the recording. This is a recording device. Would you care to leave a message? Oh, these modern idiotic devices. I say the same thing about every day. Quincy, look in the dash there, will you? Nope. What's the matter with Benson? There's Benson's name being thrown under the bus. So this is kind of neat because we are now hearing the moment we saw earlier in the storm. You sure your cigar case isn't in your coat pocket? You may start your message now. Yeah, uh, just give me the, the, the box. Man, if I had to wait this long for the answering machine lady to finish her greeting, I would hang up. It took an entire 30 seconds for her to let you know you can start talking. Want me to pull over and open that for you? No, that's all right. I got it. Now Roger knows the cigar box has been opened and causes him to check his watch. David just kind of slowly rambles on for a whole 65 seconds with a mention that Roger wanted to talk to Doris about something and then he hangs up. Bye bye for now, Donna. Columbo either very clumsily or very tactfully knocks over a drink, and the reaction from Roger is quite annoyed and flustered. Then Aunt Dory says a bit of a dim line to Roger to share in front of Columbo. Roger, you're just as concerned about him as I am, aren't you? You seem so upset. I'm surprised because you don't like him very much, do you? Oh, uh, well, actually, I, I've, been growing, I've been growing much fonder of him uh, lately. Roger tells Columbo to hurry up and go out there and find David, and then kind of rushes Columbo to the door. But before Columbo leaves, he asks Roger if his parents are alive. Oh, no, they died when I was in college. It was a freak explosion at the plant. Aunt Dory became my guardian, and then she married David. So I was under the impression that Aunt Dory adopted him as a kid, but it sounds like she adopted him as a college student. Columbo then tries getting the family tree straight by asking about aunts and uncles and children. Well, in case you're wondering, if anything does happen to David, his money goes to her, not me. Oh, I wasn't thinking about that at all. Oh, no. Oh, Columbo. Right before Columbo walks out the door, he asks Roger if his watch is broken. My watch? Broken? No, why? Inside, I noticed you kept looking at it. Well, you know, Lieutenant, um, people do 
Look at their watches. That's right, they do. It shouldn't be suspicious for Roger to look at his watch. Yes, they certainly do. Sorry. But Columbo decided to make something of it. Now that Columbo left, Aunt Dory asked Roger what David meant when he said Roger wanted to talk to her about something. See, I had this idea I might like to work in the legal department for a while. David said it was fine. I start there Monday. Oh, life would be so simple if you two could just get along. We're going to. So I wanted to mention that this house is the same house used in Ransom for a Dead Man. This is the room that Leslie made the ransom note, and where the police and Leslie talked about the ransom money. Looks like many of the same books are still here, as well as that old trophy-looking thing. And here is the fireplace where Paul Williams burns his junk mail before getting shot. It looks like they removed the carpet. Here's the hall leading to the door and so on. Now scene change to the aerial tram traveling up the mountain. Some view. Hi, Lieutenant. I bet we can maybe guess how Columbo's doing in there, but before we continue the story, let's talk about this tramway. It is located in Palm Springs, California, and is considered a great engineering feat because of its unprecedented use of helicopters in the construction of four out of the five tram towers. The route is from the floor of Coachella Valley to almost the top of San Jacinto Peak. The tramway was first opened September 1963, and there's Governor Brown cutting the ribbon. It is a 12 and a half minute ride, climbing a total of 5,873 feet, or 1,790 meters from the Sonoran Desert up to the Alpine Forest. Besides Columbo's short fuse, this tram makes an appearance on the first episode of Mannix, an episode of Mission Impossible called The Tram, an I Spy episode, the films The Wrecking Crew and Coach, and the TV movie Skyway to Death. The tram in this episode has been replaced with a rotating aerial tram and currently, in 2022, costs about $30 a ticket to ride. All right, now back to the show. All the way to the top, 8,600 feet above sea level. As the Pine Wild Sergeant admires the tram and all its surroundings, Columbo is doing his best to keep it together. We first learn about Columbo's troubles with heights in Ransom for a Dead Man when he was in the helicopter and when he was on the plane. Since then, he has kept his feet firmly on the ground. But today, we have an enjoyable scene full of wonderful cinematography from the tram and Columbo's stiff composure on the ride. The sergeant is played by Steve Gravers. He was in Al Capone with James Gregory, 40 Pounds of Trouble with Suzanne Plachette, and several different TV shows throughout the 60s and 70s. During the time of filming, this tram was closed to the public every Tuesday and Wednesday during off-season, which gave the crew just two days to film everything they needed with the tram for this episode. Here's Columbo hanging on for dear life and doing his best to act natural while walking very rigid-like. The sergeant walks Columbo to a waiting 1955 Jeep CJ6 to drive him to the site where a car bumper was found. And then we see a body-shaped bundle being lifted by a crane out of the valley, and somehow Columbo guesses who it is. What is that, Quincy the chauffeur? Yeah, we spotted Buckner's body further down there. The sergeant suggests Columbo step out on the ledge for a better view, and I love Columbo's face during this. Thank you very much, that would be necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The sergeant mentions that there are bits of car pieces scattered up and down the road all over the place. Well, maybe the car skidded and smacked that rock and the gas tank blew. Or maybe something inside the car blew. Exactly. And since they're just out from L.A., in a way it's sort of your jurisdiction, Lieutenant. What does that mean, they're just out from L.A.? L.A. and Palm Springs are over 100 miles apart. Palm Springs is way over in Riverside County, nowhere near Columbo's jurisdiction. But I won't argue because the tramway area is a really cool backdrop for a Columbo episode. So we'll pretend Palm Springs is, quote, just out from L.A. What difference does it make? Dead is, is dead, isn't it? Aunt Dory's line makes her sound like she doesn't care how someone dies. Just the fact that they're dead is all that matters. Did I tell you that David had... Decided to put Roger in the legal department? Did he? Well, there's a familiar face. This is the vice president of the company, Everett Logan, played by William Wyndham. We already met him in Prescription Murder. From my observations in the comment section of that video, there are a lot of William Wyndham fans, which is great. He is one of the three actors in this episode that appears in Planet of the Apes series. We haven't talked about Aunt Dory yet, have we? She is played by Ida Lupino. She was the lead actress in Her First Affair, which was practically Ida's very first acting role. You'll also find her in The Light That Failed, The Sea Wolf, High Sierra, Pillow to Post, The Man I Love, 
every episode of Mr. Adams and Eve, and many guest appearances on various TV shows and movies. We will get to see her once more in a future Columbo episode. She picks up the prevalent picture of David and asks Everett if he thinks he was murdered. Everett does his best to comfort Doris, reassuring her that he will handle everything and that she should just relax and not worry about anything. Scene change again to Columbo entering Roger's dark room to have a look around, sniffing chemicals. Then he notices an unlabeled aerosol can on the floor, looks at it, points the nozzle at his face, and sprays. Why in the wide world of dark rooms and chemicals would anyone ever spray an unknown nozzle into their face? Defenders of Columbo might say, well, maybe he knew what was in it and deliberately sprayed himself to play the fool in order to keep Roger disarmed. But come on, Columbo didn't know what that was. Practically nobody at all knew what Silly String was at the time. And so Roger opens the door to his dark room and begins to laugh and take pictures of Columbo's blunder. Columbo walks out and is just covered with silly string, so he must have been spraying himself for quite a while to get that much on him. Well, I wanted to mention a couple things real quick. Roddy McDowell, playing Roger here, was a photographer of Hollywood stars in real life. I think the constant photo takings in this episode is just a nod to his other occupation. Also, the silky powder blue lounge shirt he's wearing is the exact same shirt he wore in the Night Gallery pilot episode named The Cemetery, which I highly recommend you check out. You'll get to learn a new name that you'll never forget after watching it. Well, as I breathe and live, if it isn't Osmond Portafoy. Osmond Portafoy. Columbo compliments Roger's dark room. And now, Lieutenant, I also work on inventions in there, and you were very lucky that you didn't knock over a bottle of acid or some cyanide crystals, uh, nitroglycerin. Uh, Roger, I don't think you should be mentioning your possession of nitroglycerin, since it is a very important ingredient for explosives. Well, you really know that stuff, don't you? I noticed that metal you wear around your neck. I had my PhD in chemistry before I was 21. But that's before my uh, MBA. And here's where we get to learn that Roger is actually quite a smart little fella, if you didn't think he was based on the opening scene preparing that explosive. You know, I knew you'd be the one that could help me. Would you come? Watching Roger and Columbo, you can quite easily tell their voices were recorded post-production because their voices and their mouths don't line up very well. In fact, if you are particularly observant, there are multiple scenes dubbed over throughout this episode, and this is because the director, Ed Abrams, knowing all about post-production editing, used this strategy to his advantage in order to keep things moving. He shot several scenes at a great distance, and then the actors recorded their dialogue later. This was one way to reduce the need for extra takes. So, during this scene, Columbo's talking about how poorly he did in chemistry when he was in high school, so in order to improve his overall grades, he dropped chemistry and took woodshop. You know, you just build a birdhouse and if you paint it red, you get an A. <laughs> and Roger does his little laugh the whole conversation. Looking at this huge tower, you'd certainly expect Columbo would be scared stiff, but he doesn't seem to mind it here. I forgot to mention earlier that the Stanford chemical plant was filmed at Union Carbide Chemical Corporation in Torrance, California. They make, like, asbestos and stuff. Come to think of it, why are Roger and Columbo even on this tower? They certainly didn't exit Roger's office up there. What are they doing up there? Columbo passively talks about triggered devices that don't use powder, like maybe explosive vials, and so Roger naturally shares his understanding. Oh, so you think someone put a bomb in his car? Roger goes on to count how many PhDs and chemists are working at the plant to help muddy the water. I can't tell you how many executives there are in our ivory tower who would uh, commit felonious assault just for the key to a private washroom. Roger also mentions how many people are angry about the threat of the company being sold. Do you remember that recorded telephone message? Well, I've been listening to that over and over again. It's all right in there. And I'll tell you what, this is one area that I do know about. Columbo goes to visit Miss Bishop about cigars, since she was responsible for getting the cigar box for the drive. She mentions the cleaning lady gave her the pocket cigar case that was found under her desk. It must have been in Mr. Buckner's overcoat. That's where he always kept it. And you see, Benson put the overcoat on the suitcase. It must have fallen out. Who is this Benson guy? 
On that telephone tape, you could just barely hear cigar case missing. You thought that someone wanted him to open a box of cigars while he was still in the car. Miss Bishop is so confused why Columbo's questioning her about cigars. The lieutenant is from Homicide, and obviously he is under the impression that the accident was caused by uh, an exploding cigar. What? Then Roger goes and grabs a box and offers a cigar to Columbo. Never saw cigars quite like this before. Don't you tell customs. They're from Cuba. Wow, so these really are Fidel's finest. Roger suggests that if there was a bomb in the car, it would have had to been placed somewhere else. No. Columbo says nope, because he bumped into Ferguson, who cleaned the car himself, and he said there was nothing in the car but a suitcase, a coat, and a box of cigars. Then the uh, explosive must have been in the cigar box. Yeah, I'll grant you that, Lieutenant. Yes, because of course the explosive couldn't have been planted under the car or under the hood. It had to have been the cigar box. There's just no other explanation. Miss Bishop, will you tell me how long the DL suitcase sit there in the middle of this floor with people coming and going. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to this lighter. This is the lighter David was using earlier. I really like all lighters, but I'm very fascinated by lighters that you have to hold with your entire hand. <coughs> and uh, noticing the dickering elephant in the room, we accidentally learn that he dresses to the left and can no longer be unseen. Director Abrams was probably unaware of the situation in the middle of the frame, and since the scene was likely done in one take, nobody else had the chance to make an alternative costume suggestion. Anyway, let's move on. Miss Bishop remembers that the Vice President, Mr. Logan, also has a supply stock of cigar boxes in his office, so Columbo pays him a visit next. Hmm, I have about, uh, about four boxes left. I love how much time he spends counting the three boxes. Did you say four, sir? Yes, that's very strange. Mr. Logan calls his secretary, Nancy, into the office. Did you take some home, Mr. Logan? No, I did not. Oh, well, they must be in here someplace. And then Nancy starts searching the empty shelf for a giant hidden cigar box. That'll be all, Nancy. Thank you. You can go now. Yes, sir. Nancy's played by Rosalind Miles. She was in the TV movie The Turning Point of Jim Malloy, Friday Foster, and a couple episodes of Here's Lucy. Roger nonchalantly reveals why Columbo's poking about. He thinks there might have been a bomb in a cigar box. What? Mr. Logan assures Columbo he will cooperate with the police, but please don't leak one word about a possible murder to the press or anyone else. Columbo reassures him that there won't be, and he leaves. Thank you very much. Much about. Then the tune that I think could have, or should have, been the Columbo theme begins to play. Roger pulls up behind Columbo on his Harley and offers to give him a lift to his car. I noticed during this shot that there is like a spotlight shining right in their faces the whole time. The sun must not have been in the right position for this scene, so Abram solved it with a bright light. Also, it looks like there's some black electrical tape covering up the name Harley Davidson on the front of this cart. I really don't understand this business stuff. My wife, she always makes out her taxes. Oh, by the way, Benson mentioned that Quincy was one time a cop. Good thing the elusive Benson is helping out Columbo. Columbo says he can't find the typewriter that a piece of hearsay gossip was typed on that he found in Quincy's trash. And Benson, uh, he had an idea that Quincy might have had another hideaway someplace. Man, thank merciful goodness for Benson and his information. Columbo asks Roger if he knows anything about the other hideaway. Roger says during a poker game with Quincy, he saw a piece of paper in his wallet that said O'Neill. Yeah, that's what he said. Harry J. O'Neill. Yeah, but, well, you know, I can check up on that right away. The car's right over here. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. And Columbo gets into his car and drives away. Roger drives over to his own car to leave, and then Miss Bishop trots out after him. She's all distraught because of how much investigations are going on, and... She's concerned about them finding something. I don't want anyone to find out about us. How could they? You took those pictures of me. Uh-huh. Roger claims he has cleaned out his desk and the dark room days ago, and that she has nothing to worry about. I'm sorry. It's, it's just the past few days I... Uh, you know, you need a rest. Yep. Roger tries to get away from her with some gentle rudeness. He arrives at a house in a more inner-city-looking area and sets out the typewriter. Then he unremorsefully pats the top of a picture and we zoom in to find it is Quincy and his girl. The scene fades into a nighttime shot with policemen pulling up and Roger just hanging out inside the place waiting for something to happen.
Roger realizes it's authority figures, checks his pocket to make sure he has a particular piece of paper, and then takes a lamp and drops it noisily on the floor. There shouldn't be anybody in there. Cover the front. I'll get the back. And then bolts out of the house. The shouldn't be anyone in there guy is played by Jim Newmarker. He has four acting roles, one being this episode, the other being in The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, Adam-12, and the TV movie Set This Town on Fire. When I very first saw the scene, I could not figure out what was going on. I don't think I really figured it out the second time I watched it either. As Roger lazily runs from the cops, clearly not trying that hard to get away, the scene changes to Aunt Doris asking him what on earth he was doing. Nothing. Well, I do wish you would listen to me, Aunt Dory. You haven't answered me. I can't. Columbo shows up and this policeman tells him what Roger did. He broke an ant head, tore up the place, resisted arrest. They literally jumped me. The stern policeman is played by Jason Wingreen. He was in a lot of different TV shows, some of the main ones being The Untouchables, The Long Hot Summer, All in the Family, Archie Bunker's Place, and Matlock. He also played Dr. Brody in the movie Airplane. So basically the reason for the scene of Roger running from the cops and the whole reason he set up that situation was to make him appear like a good guy to Aunt Doris. He ransacked the place in order to gather up embarrassing information or her hurtful information to protect his Aunt Doris. Look, if I could just talk to you alone for a few minutes. Excuse me, please. Policeman Farrell shows up saying he found quite a bit of stuff at Quincy's hideaway. Dossiers and the like. What kind of dossiers? Something about Mr. Logan? Well, what makes you say that? Doris says she found a report in one of David's coats about Mr. Logan, full of personal and damaging information. From Quincy? Yes. May I see it? I burned it, Lieutenant. You see, I finally realized that David was using Quincy to keep tabs on the executives. Well, if you haven't caught on yet, Roger has been busy planting evidence in all sorts of strategic places to make David look like a really bad guy digging up dirt on anyone he can. And then Farrell hands over the dirtiest of dirt that he said Roger was trying to keep from them when they picked him up. I like how Farrell keeps the pictures out and visible as he walks around like he wants Mrs. Buckner to see them. Wait a minute, that's evidence, lady. No, don't let her see them. Aunt Dory, you give them back. Valerie, Bishop, and David? We do get a glimpse of the pictures, and it just looks like a guy in a suit and a brunette lady in a dress. And I'm not really sure what's going on in these other two, but they are very similar to each other. I know these pictures are supposed to depict an affair between Miss Bishop and David that Roger edited together, and I find it very interesting that the prop picture was detailed enough to at least have a man and a woman, when it doesn't seem like the audience was even meant to see it at all. Well, Farrell, the guy waving around adulterous photos, is played by Lou Brown. He had several appearances on the TV show Death Valley Days, The Virginian, The FBI, Gunsmoke, and Days of Our Lives. We will see him again in a future Columbo episode. Why do you think I went there? I knew Quincy would have something like that. Now you've let her see the very thing I never wanted her to. Then Aunt Dory lets Columbo know she's had enough for tonight. Uh, Will you please get out of here and leave us alone? Look, I'm sorry about what's happening here tonight. Lieutenant, please get out. So Columbo and the fellas leave, but before Columbo walks out the door, he listens in on Roger and Doris. Roger reveals that he has known about the affair for a couple of years, and Doris concludes that no wonder David didn't like him if he knew about their relationship. And so she hugs Roger who makes the most triumphant face, looking as though he is sitting real good, now that Aunt Dory is certainly on his side. And now a 1969 Cadillac Fleetwood 75 pulls up, and the driver gets out to open the door. Thank you, Benson. Five o'clock, please. Oh, well, there's Benson. Unfortunately, I can't identify him, but it's good to know he, he really does exist. And now you and I can talk about Benson and how he drove that car that one time. Roger heads into the office building and bumps into the man from the beginning of the episode. Oh, hi, Junior. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Stanford. This man is played by Stuart Nisbet. He had such notable roles as Laundry Man in Bridget Loves Bernie, Man Opening Boxcar in A Man Called Gannon, and who could forget his role in The Shakiest Gun in the West, as man going upstairs. As Roger enters the office, he sees Miss Bishop super concerned, looking at a paper from personnel. That stupid personnel department, you're not fired. But I don't understand. Roger goes on to say that his aunt remembers how much Miss Bishop's mother wanted to live in the desert of Arizona, and that she might be happier there too. Listen now, don't you worry. 
we'll see each other a lot. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah, a lot. <laughs> so this is Roger's way of breaking up and getting rid of her. Roger walks into his Uncle David's office that looks like it's about to be remodeled. This man in the blue is played by George Sawaya. He was in The Man from Uncle, Mannix, and Mission Impossible TV series. He was also a stuntman. Some of his stunts being performed in Batman 1966, Bonnie and Clyde, Dirty Harry, Blazing Saddles, The Godfather Part 2, Escape from New York, Blade Runner, and Beneath the Planet of the Apes. So yes, we have another to add to the Planet of the Apes cast in this episode. We're also going to see him again in two more Columbo episodes. Roger shoos away the workers and sits at his Uncle Dave its old desk, which is now Roger's new desk. He does the mandatory chair spin and feet up on the desk, and then he looks over at his Uncle David's favorite picture. I don't want to be disturbed, Miss Bishop. It's Mr. Logan and Lieutenant Columbo. Uh, we'll tell them, uh, tell them to come in. Roger quickly makes himself appear busy. Columbo and Mr. Logan come in, and we learn that Mr. Logan has been fired. Oh. Obviously, it's a mistake. Isn't Obviously. It? Columbo picks up the picture of David. This must have fallen over. Lieutenant, you've taken an inordinate length of time to come to the point. Columbo says the people from Pine Wild Sheriff's office found something very important at the crash site. I mean, you are interested in any latest development, aren't you? Well, of course I am. What was it? You know, they didn't say. If this does concern my uncle's death, I, I suppose in good conscience I should go along. So Columbo pulls up with Logan and Roger in the car, and the Pine Wild Sergeant walks up to them with a bag. What is it, Lieutenant? I think that we ought to get this information to your aunt in a hurry. And Columbo kind of rushes the two men toward the aerial tram. Oh look, sighting number two of Mike Lowley as the tram operator. Also, this man getting off the tram is played by George Simmons. He is our first professionally uncredited actor in this episode. He showed up in the background in lots of popular TV shows of the 60s and 70s. He was even in the movie The Cheap Detective starring Peter Falk. I also forgot to mention him during the inquest in Lady in Waiting. He was sitting back there by Katherine Jansen. We'll see George again in a future Columbo episode. Here's another man I can identify. This is Kai J. Wong. He is our second uncredited only actor. He was an extra here and there in a variety of movies and TV shows during the 60s and 70s as well. Nothing too heavy. So Columbo, Roger, and Everett board the aerial tram and Mr. Lally closes the doors. Columbo sits down and unwraps the item in the bag and it is... What? Wait a minute. I told you this would be worth coming out for, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah, it sure is. Then Columbo pulls the tape off the left side of the box, which is getting Roger very concerned. Must have been the gas tank after all. Yeah, what a crazy coincidence, huh, Roger? And then we find out why Everett Logan was fired, because Columbo starts letting loose on all the reports that Quincy wrote that were actually written by Roger, of course. Yeah, I think she fired you for a couple of reasons. Those secret meetings that you had with the competition, that patent that you sold to a friend. Those are lies. Really? While Columbo was talking, we had a glimpse of that cigar box again with that piece of black tape replaced. You promised Aunt Dory never to say anything about that. Well, it doesn't make any difference now because of this. Then Roger gets ants in the pants for a second. Well, why we can't uh, sit here, sit here quietly while we ride to the top of the mountain? Columbus starts talking to Roger about he actually had a theory that Roger was the one who rigged the cigar box, and what a silly idea it was. Now, <sighs> now. <sighs> Turns out to be just an ordinary cigar box. <laughs> then Columbo again tries to take off the left piece of tape while Roger replaces the right side's piece of tape. Roger suggests Columbo bring the cigar box to a laboratory to be examined since he had all these fancy theories about it. Sounds like Roger really wouldn't care if an entire laboratory of scientists got blown up. What on earth for? Theories are all wrong. And that would all be proven. <laughs> Look, Mr. Logan, would you care for a cigar? Roger immediately looks at his watch, realizing that he has about one minute to decide what to do. I really like the editing here. Columbo is constantly talking to Roger, but we keep seeing scenes flash of when Roger was creating and setting the bomb in the box, giving off the impression that he is not listening to a single word Columbo is saying. Roger glances back down at his watch. 30 seconds have gone by. Would you do me a favor? Would you please keep quiet? And that encourages Columbo to talk even more. A minute has gone by, and Roger is unable to hold in his panic. The what? Will you just shut up? Roger, what's bothering you? What's the matter? Shut up! We have got to get rid of that box! 
And then Roger flings open the door. Check out the cinematography. Wow. Very impressive and quite dangerous, I would think. Then Roger charges for the box and the cigars spill all over the floor. Whoa. Roddy the actor almost dove out of the tram. In the next shot, the door is closed again, which is probably best. He then starts frantically checking each cigar while Columbo and Everett watch him. Everett asks Columbo where he got that box, and Columbo says he got it from his secretary. My secretary? I hope he didn't mind. During their exchange, it dawns on Roger what just happened. Columbo bends down to take a fistful of cigars, but Everett brings up the fact that they're evidence. I guess they, uh, it's a shame, though. And he tosses them to the floor, where Roger sits like a child with his toys. Roger begins to <laughs> chuckle, and then he stands up and starts laughing hysterically, removing his Honor Society medal from around his neck and placing it around Columbo's, acknowledging who the true genius is. And the episode very effectively fades with the echoing laughter of Roger. On Wednesday, September 15, 1971, the morning after finishing up filming Short Fuse, Peter Falk made his flight to New York on time. That evening, NBC Mystery Movie premiered with Murder by the Book, and critics raved about Columbo being the season's greatest new show. Peter Falk was actually kind of annoyed by the success of Columbo at the time because after each of his Broadway performances of Prisoner of Second Avenue, Anyone who came backstage, like well-wishers or reporters, showed very little interest in his stage performance and instead continually asked and talked about Columbo. A quote from Peter Falk. When people came backstage, they don't talk about the play. It's Columbo, Columbo, Columbo. I'm going nuts. Well now, short fuse and my opinions. First, I'll mention that the amount of bashing this episode gets from other Columbo fans really surprises me. People say this episode is boring, confusing, and annoying. I'll give them the confusing argument because there are some convoluted storylines, but boring and annoying? I don't think so. People particularly don't like Roger's character because he acts too silly and foolish to be the genius the story suggests he is. And I find that to be a pretty weak argument. Proclaimed geniuses are some of the most socially unaware and awkward human beings on the face of the planet. Another complaint I read was that Columbo and Roger don't have any chemistry with each other. Well, I don't think chemistry should be a requirement for every story. It certainly wouldn't work that way in real life. Besides, there was enough chemistry going on in the factory. And if you look back there, there is a little stamp of proof that this factory was indeed Union Carbide. If Short Fuse is still on your list of worst Columbo episodes, I think, knowing what you know now, you should give it another watch. Give this episode a break. Remember, the majority of the scenes were filmed in one take. I'd say the acting is quite remarkable considering that fact. And even though the plot can get a little confusing at times and could do with some tightening, you still understand the overall story, don't you? I do have some specific critiques to share and then I will rate the episode. So one of my critiques takes place during my favorite scene, and most people's favorite scene in the episode, the finale. Remember, Roger had already heard the recording of his uncle's call from the car phone, so he knew his uncle had opened the rigged cigar box. When Columbo opens the cigar box on the tram, Roger should have remembered that, and he also should have noticed the trigger mechanism was missing and that Columbo was trying to trap him. So, he could have called Columbo's bluff and just played right along with Columbo. But we'll agree with the episode and say he didn't see the trigger mechanism was missing and he really did believe this was the rigged cigar box. Well, then, if, if I were Roger and I really thought this was the bomb, I would have politely asked to hold the cigar box and then open the door of the tram and throw the box out into the mountains. Even if that was odd behavior in front of these two men, that's what I would have done. But we'll say the cigar spilled onto the floor before we had a chance to throw out the box. Now my immediate thought would be to shove all the cigars out the door. Definitely not pick up each one to find the bomb. Time is ticking, as we all well know. Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. And my final little critique is the fact that Columbo decides at the beginning that it was the cigar box that must have caused the explosion, and he just runs with it. He never figures there is any other possibility. They try to tell us that the big clue was the phone call, where we find out there weren't any cigars in the dash or in the coat. 
The only option for cigars was the box. Therefore, the box contained the explosives. None of the other clues or information pointed toward the cigar box. It was just Columbo being Columbo. So, after mentioning all that, what do I rate Short Fuse? Well, it certainly doesn't align with the majority, but I give it five Columbo cigars out of five. Yes, five of Fidel's finest. Your reaction's probably, what? Five? But I really like this episode. It's got amazing locations and cinematography, and I enjoy Roddy McDowell's acting. I think he's funny. I'm funny how? I mean funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you? What do you mean funny? Funny how? How am I funny? And I also like everyone else's acting for that matter. The music is fantastic, the editing is extremely effective. Sure, you and I could complain and pick at the episode all day, but if it's so bad, why do I enjoy watching it so much? When I'm watching Short Fuse, I'm having a great time. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a very individual person. Just like you. You're a very individual person. And one more thing before I go. Thank you to all my benefactors. My coffee-gifting Columbo fanatics. It's people like you that help the world go around. Again, I'm sorry for how long it took me to finish this episode. There was just one thing that just kept slowing me down, and that was... The world, Chico. And everything in it. Want to hear a little trivia? Not only are there several cast members from Planet of the Apes in this episode, there's also a load of Twilight Zone cast members. Peter Falk, Roddy McDowell, Anne Francis, James Gregory, Ida Lupino, William Wyndham, Lou Brown, Jason Wingreen, Stuart Nisbet, and Mike Lowley. Once in a while, I'll get a question in the comments asking me what my favorite episodes are. I don't have a single favorite episode, but if I rate it five cigars, it's seriously one of my favorites, and I could watch it for days.